Hey, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. I'll remind finally, everybody to finally. like, subscribe, share, comment. Uh, that helps people uh, see the show and shit. And if there's any uh, questions that you guys have or guests that you'd like to see, make sure you put that in the comments as well. We'll try to get those people on. And uh, yeah, finally, dude, the lie have been like three or four times in the last couple of years. I've tried to get you on and it never worked twice. out. <laughs> twice. twice. The twice. first time your gym, your gym flooded the day of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the second time help. you were in a coma, you were in a coma. So I'll, I'll forgive you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so how is, how is the hip? How's that doing right now? Actually, the, the left one that uh, operated side is way better than the other side. So yeah. It's a, it's it's a performance enhancer, so to speak. Yeah. It yeah. It, it it does feel like that. It's, it's way it's stronger. It's yeah. more more flexible, and they had to go in through my through my butt cheek, mm-hmm. and they they have to take they have to take take off the the piriformis muscle. They have to take it off the bone to get to the joint, mm-hmm. and now. For some reason, that that glute doesn't fire as well, so there's more tension. So my body tries to compensate with the with the quad. So when I train legs, I get way more quad stimulation now than than on the other yeah. side, which right. which is cool, which is cool because it makes the quad bigger. But I wish it was even. So I've got to right. get the other one done. So and there's a metal rod in there, right? And through the through the with, with the femur and everything, you've got a metal rod going up into your hip. Yes, I uh, just got, that's got to make it stronger too. Yeah, they, I, and the thing is that you know people always ask me, yeah, what did the doctor say? How much weight can you put on it? And I was, how the fuck would I know? How the fuck would he know? It's like right. it's not it's not that they have tested uh, a million right. different. You know, strength athletes with right. with hip replacements. There's no study on it. You know, or, or you take a you take a hundred people and then and test how much weight you can put on it until it breaks. It's kind right. of not ethical, right? So yeah, that's, yeah, that's not a study that anybody's doing. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just whenever I do whenever I I put more weight on the bar, I'm 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 in uncharted territory every time. Sure. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would be so now the issue you had, the dysplasia issue you had with that hip, is that a problem on both sides and just one was wore out f- uh, further than the other one? Or is it that nothing you're going to have to worry about with the other one either? Uh, sooner or later, I have to get the other one done. It already, right. I got to tell you, it already feels a little funny. Yeah. You know? But it's not as bad as, not bad enough to do anything about it. You know, it's, sure. It has. It has um, the the internal rotation is not as good as it should be, um, and sometimes I get a little bit of an impingement. But you know, we all have pains. My elbow yeah. hurts. Yeah, yeah. Hurts. yeah. So, Trust okay. me. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't think there's a single spot on my body right now that doesn't fucking ache. So. Yes. And it, 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 you just you live with it and you deal with it the best you can. And if it gets too bad, then you got to get it fixed. Yeah. Um. So you're you've got a run of shows coming up starting in September, correct? That you're going to do. There's like seven IFBB shows over in Europe that are like all within a couple hours of you. Yeah, that's my plan. That's my plan. Yeah. And so we got. It's actually, I wanted to do the Indie Pro and the New York, uh, Florida right. Pro, whatever it's called right now. But I figured. First of all, right now what I'm what I'm what I'm doing works really well, so I'm really growing at, mm-hmm. at this point. And I started dieting for two weeks, and then I thought the whole two weeks, I thought, man, I'm wasting my time because I had such good progress. Sure. And now you got to you know inter- interrupt it, you know, and then diet down. So. The ball was rolling, so I figured, well, no, I'm not going to diet. I'm just going to postpone the whole thing for a couple of months and then do the shows in Europe. First of all, it's cheaper, you know? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because if I had gone to the U.S. for those two shows, I would have 
I would have had to stay three weeks, you know, one week before the Indie Pro, and then I think New York is two weeks later, so I, I would have had to stay at least three weeks. Then you got to worry about where you get your gear and where you uh, hotel costs and flights and all that. But so all the back into the country. <laughs> yeah. Plus all the bullshit all with the, with the airlines too, trying to travel uh, from Europe over to here and back again. That I mean, that's a fucking yeah. nightmare right now. Still. Yes. And then I figured, well, there's two shows in Spain, two in Italy, one in in the UK, and one in Romania, and one in France. So they are all one hour, two hour flights. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Doing all those shows with all the flights and all the hotels is probably cheaper than staying in the U.S. for three weeks. So it's probably cheaper than doing one show in the U.S. Trying trying to get mm -hmm. over here and with everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about as much bullshit either. I mean. And when I qualify for the Olympia, they're, play, they're, they're paying my travel. Well, there you so go. Good. <laughs> you don't have to worry about it then if they, yeah. once, you, once you qualify. So, yeah. So, you're, uh, you've got, so which, which one's the first one? The first one is one of those in Spain. Okay. And the second right, so is, is in, in the UK. That's the uh, Arnold UK, correct? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember if that was the first first one over there, if it was one of the one of the second or thirds one. I couldn't remember if there was one or two in front of that. So I, I don't see how you shouldn't qualify for the Olympia, to be honest with you. You got seven shows. If anything, you could qualify on points just by doing all seven of those or even five of those. But you should be able to win a couple of those pretty easily over in Romania, Spain, all those, those shows that those should be very easy shows for you to win, especially as shredded as you come in. Yeah, I've placed in Spain. The last time I uh, competed in Spain, there was 2018. I placed third and I'm yeah. way better now. So I'm, I'm oh, way yeah. better. Now. Yeah. yeah. So let's see what happens. And then oh. yeah. I'm confident. Definitely. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not going there. I'm not going there to, just be there. I'm going there to win. Definitely. Yeah, I, I heard you say that the other day. I think with, with you were with Ron and Dusty that this year's a little different for you because you're not going to do IFBB shows as a uh, you know just to do the show and and you know be a part of the show. You're going there to win now, which was yes. something that you hadn't had as an attitude before since you were an amateur. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. That was a that was a mistake to be honest. Just yeah. forgot about that. Well, I mean, hey, I, you've got you've definitely got the ability to win. I mean, you've 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 done some of the shows over here. I wasn't weren't you like fourth in Tampa or something one year too? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's good. And that's that's and that's I, always one of the top shows. Yeah. Uh, hmm? What do you think the difficulty difference is between the European shows and the US shows? For example, Keith didn't say this, but I got the impression he thinks and I would agree, I would is that it'd be easier to win in Europe than if you were to win over here at like the New York pro or the Tampa pro or the Texas pro. Do you agree with that? And if so, why do you think that is easier to compete in Europe? I don't think so because most of the time the head judge is still someone from the U S it's still Steve Weinberger. It's still mm -hmm. um, Sandy, uh, some, someone, always someone sitting in front that's, that's um, coming in from the yes i don't think i don't even think we have judges that are qualified to do that over here okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and well i would think i don't think it would be easier though i would think it was just the depth of the shows number one over here is going to be a little deeper because most of your yeah. top pros live over here and if you correct me if i'm wrong most of the IFBB shows in the United States are, are what we consider a tier one or tier two and most of the ones in Europe would be a three or four except for maybe the Arnold UK Yes, okay. I would have been asked. Okay. So it's yeah. not it's not the talent's different. It's that the, the, the shows are higher level over here. So thus the bigger the more um competitive guys compete over here. Yeah. And thought yeah. they move here rather than stay. And that brings up the next question is are you planning on moving to the US anytime soon, Roman? No, to be honest, not. It's just I have a good setup here. And it is if I want to go to the US, you know, it's it's a to New York. I think it's an eight hour flight. If I have to go there, it's just you know, it's it's of course it's more expensive. But if I had to go there, it would it would not be 
such a big deal for for sponsors and everything. Because I I've, I've worked with uh, Animal for mm-hmm. six six years, I think, and it's never been a problem with them. So they just flew me over, and that's it. Uh, yeah. And they're in Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. It was always the the Newark airport, and and the headquarters is in in Jer- New Brunswick. Oh, well, it's New Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're they're the East. I don't know if it was Connecticut or Jersey or where it was at over there. But yeah, the reason East I thought Coast it was based. Montanero's brother area. I thought they, all their dudes came from uh, Connecticut, but that's probably just because Evan's been their main dude for so long. I associate yeah. Evan and all together. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um. So. I, I should have done a Q&A for this one. I should have put some questions up and stuff, but I got some 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 great, some great questions I wanted to ask you and stuff, and it goes back <laughs> to your uh, amateur days with your three okay. pro cards that you won. <laughs> yeah. I have a story. I'm sure a lot of people have heard this story before, but uh, if you want to give us the, uh, the quick version of it. So I won the first one. That was the World Championships in 2009. They get, have given out a pro card for that. I didn't take it because... I weighed in at a hundred, I think at a hundred and one kilos. That's like two thirty at five eleven. Right. So, so there was no point in not even two thirty. I think it's two twenty seven. So, there's no point in taking a pro card if you don't if you can't compete five years afterwards or three years in order if you got to put on thirty pounds or something. Yeah? Right. So didn't take that one, and then I had a little bit. I had some had knee injury that took me out for a year, and I fucked up one show. I fucked up one show really bad, and so I lost two years there. And then I went back to the. I did the Iron Classic Amateur, 2013. Mm-hmm. I was going to win. I, I, I was winning. Okay, there was no, no contest. I was really good. I was really good. And then when I arrived in, in Ohio on Monday, it was fine. Tuesday morning, I woke up and I had diarrhea for two days straight. Two days was terrible. And I went from, Flat. Yeah, I went from 240, <laughs> went from 240 to 215. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> in two days. And then I was, I only placed, I only placed third. In the heavyweight, right, and um, yeah, yeah, because you had to weigh in as a heavyweight, not as a super, <laughs> because you had lost so much weight. And then wow. after I took third, that was fucked up. So then I went to I did I did the German Nationals six weeks later, and I won that overall. I actually beat the other guy from Germany that competed with me in the Arnold Classic Amateur. So he took second there, and I took third, and then then I beat him. Right. Um, they told me I was gonna. I'm I'm getting a pro card for this one. They congratulated me. They, the, the president of the federation asked me, ah, what pro show are you gonna do first? Like on on interview on on video. Yeah. And then come December, I'm asking. That was in May. Come December, I just wanted to know. So how do I get the paperwork for my pro card, what I was supposed to do? And then they told me, ah, mm, kid, we're sorry. It doesn't happen. It's not going to happen. What, what, what do you mean it's not going to happen? I just signed a, a, a universal nutrition contract based on the fact that I just turned pro six mm-hmm. months earlier. So, but they, they weren't mad at me. They, they just thought, yeah, okay, we can't do anything about that. And they told me I just win another one. Just it doesn't matter. Win another one. Yeah. They didn't give it so easy because it's so yeah. easy to win. Wait, yeah. I don't. Just, why? Why didn't they? What's the explanation as to why they didn't award you the pro card? They changed the rules. They, they, they changed the rules. So I said, okay, they, they, you changed the rules for next year, right? Yes. Right. So how I'm? But I wanted last year. So I'm supposed to be grandfathered in. Ah, no, no. Uh, mm. But but you could make a, a, a small donation maybe, and then we can yeah. rethink the whole thing. 
Oh, so they want money grab. They want money. <laughs> there, story, how much is a small donation? Ten grand. I don't know. I, I didn't ask. I didn't ask. Uh, I dude, just, I that, was, uh, that was Raphael would, that was just, running the IFBB mm-hmm. over in Europe at that point, correct? Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. how it is. If you want to open like a bakery, then they're like, oh, well, you know, we can't really let the fire marshal clear this. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's like you need to submit a second form. Well, what's the fee for the second form? It's like eight grand. So yeah. if you submit, <laughs> it's like, well, we got to have the building commission inspector come by and check. Well, how much is, mm-hmm. when's that appointment? Well, you have to pay for the appointment. Well, how much is that appointment? Eight grand. And so that ends up being 50 to 100 grand for you just to open. The, the city mm-hmm. extorts you for money and everybody gets their pockets lined. And then you actually, it's just part of doing business. Yeah, that's what, that's what, that's actually, that's exactly how that they were going to do it with me. I saw, so I wasn't, I was, I think I was 20, 20, 24, something like that. So I just got my universal nutrition contract. I got $1,200. I was really happy about that one month. So <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't afford that. And I figured, well, I'm going to win another one. I told Universal I'm going to win another one in six months. There was the Amateur Olympia in Prague. That was the second time they had the Amateur Olympia. The first one, Rami won a year earlier. Yeah. That was so lucky I didn't. I had to do try that one. <laughs> <laughs> and then I won that. That was cool. That was cool. And I was on stage, you know, with the big mock up pro car. So I had photo proof this time. <laughs> it's the one that's going to take off of me. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they actually, I mean, they, I think they gave. I don't think they gave me one when I won it. I don't even remember now. I remember the year before I won my class twice in one day and they just didn't give it to me mm. and everyone else got one, but me and I was like, this is bullshit. And then when I did win one, I didn't get the actual, like the little placard mm-hmm. because there was no one there. It was just a camera and four judges in the back of the tent. And so it's like, there's no one to impress or show off for. So it's just like, here you go, kid. Here's a medal. And it's like, okay. Oh, yeah. And the funny thing is, funny thing is, they only gave, they only had given out pro cards at this show. They said, okay, only the overall. Yeah. But then right. there was, there was Milan Shadek. You know, probably, you know him from, he's in the 212. Mm-hmm. He won his class. And he got a pro card also. So he wasn't supposed to get a pro card. But I guess they probably made a small donation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now we're done with the whole, you know, IFBB Pro League thing. Luckily, they separated and we're now with yeah. IFBB Pro, pro League and right. IFBB Elite Pro, whatever. Yeah, that happened in, was it 2017, 2018? 18. No, I was 17. I think 17. 17 is when it happened because it happened right around the time mm. of the Arnold Classic because they had come in, which is now IFBB uh, Elite, had came in yeah. with their judges and everything else to the arts trying to, trying to judge the Arnold Amateur and pretty much uh, manning them, told them, get the fuck out of here. We don't want anything to do with you guys. And they broke it right at that point. And that was it. That was the end of it. Yeah. So I'm confused about this. So there used to be the IFBB and the IFB Pro League, and the uh-huh. NPC was the FBB branch of the United States. Yes. And then it's so the North American was the IFBB North American because it is right, just because American. It op- because it was right. open for Canada, Mexico, and it was all of North America. Yeah. Right. And there's kind of set up like powerlifting where you have the APF and the WPC. Yes. All right. So then broke off there is a conflict between raphael and jim mannion to my understanding and then mm-hmm. there is npc worldwide so the yeah, npc yes. is your league like the ncaa and then you've got the pro league which is the ifbb pro league which is like the mm-hmm. nfl okay mm-hmm. now, yeah well what happened was he but was doing a bunch of shit under the table now there's a he, 
thing going on. You're saying that there's the IFBB worldwide amateur still exists and it goes into something called an IFBB elite. Yes. And yes. That, that guy who's um, I, there's some dude with really big arms that talks a bunch of shit. Um, uh, and I forgot. Michael Christoph. Yes, yes, yeah. And he keeps talking about, like, I'm not going to the IFPB Pro League. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? So it's he like, have, I, he would have to compete in the NPC first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, he's talking all this shit. I was like, what league do you compete in? Like, that's what's confusing. So that's what it's called is the IFBB Elite Pro. Yes. Yeah, league. It's it's IFBB Elite is what it is, and then you have the, that's the amateur organization, and then IFBB Elite Pro is the pro organization over there. And it used to just be the IFBB that was you know the IFBB Europe or whatever it was it was called over at that point worldwide whatever it was called at the time, and they just broke away. And then Mannion and them said, look, we're just going to basically make the NPC bigger. Mm-hmm. They, they got rid of the Canadian division because the Canadian division used, used to be the Canadian Physique Alliance, I think is what it used to be called. And now it's called something else that's more similar, CBA or something. Um, but it's the same thing, but it's actually part of the NPC now. But it's Canada's version of the NPC. Yep. And then they have all their pro qualifiers over in Europe and in Asia and stuff that are that are NPC shows. To yeah. earn a pro uh, a pro card, kind of like what the what the uh, the world championships used to be, but it was just more regional to to the areas. And there's like yeah. maybe five or six of them over over there every year, so they can compete. Amateur Olympias yeah. are one of them. Yeah, yeah. But then the IFBB Worldwide and Elite have their own shit that they did have. They just basically continued it, but they broke off into a different organization. And it's, I mean, it's not well, as good, obviously. Is it like one of the other organizations I don't even know the name of? Like, is there anyone in their pro shows or is it like a UFE pro show? Um, I would say it's probably on par with. Um, what is what is the name of that? There's another one. What the hell is the name of the, the other one? Um, w- that, has yeah. the, the, that has the, the yeah, NABA. It's probably mm-hmm. about, about as equal as NABA. Yeah. As a NABA pro league. Yep. They're probably on equal footing. You've got those two here, and then you've got the IFBB Pro League way up here. Yeah. Because anybody who was good at the time, there was an IFBB Pro that was from over there, jumped into the IFBB Pro League. And then, and if they were any good in the last five years, they've competed in one of the pro qualifiers through the NPC, um, and they've turned pro that way. Yeah. It is fucking complicated. And the funny it thing is. is, the funny thing is, we have those Arnold amateurs still mm-hmm. uh, for in the NPC, but there is one Arnold amateur in Spain that is still with the Elite Pro. I don't know. That's his to... show. I think that's Raphael is the one that uh, promotes that. That's why. Yeah. He just kept yeah. the Arnold name. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right, man. So you're training with a with a with a reconstructed new hip uh what's different with your training now especially your leg training and stuff now that you have you have this uh because I, I know how you trained before and you i mean you're just a freak what t- twice a day six days a week pretty much training you're, you're training 10 to 12 times a week um what have you had to change especially with leg training now because of the hip being uh surgically repaired not much to be honest i can train i, I train just the same way okay the only thing is heavy, uh, but but that's not that's not an issue with the operating side. It's an issue with the the natural side, so to speak. Right. Heavy deadlifts, uh, so the really heavy deadlifts, I like to avoid because those. Okay. This is this is the only exercise that gives me this this impingement pain at the bottom. You know, right. the, it's because of the, the hip hinging. Side. Yep. Yeah. Does that include like RDLs too? Yes. I have to stand a little wider. I have to stand a little wider, so okay. I can put my put my my torso, my trunk in between my legs. You know. Okay. And not and not just not stack it. Yeah. And then I I keep it light to but to four plates or three and a half plates, something like that, and do more reps with it. Gotcha. In order to not you know, 
the, the right hip is going to go at some point. It is right. just, yeah. It's going to. So, yes. But so I, I, I don't want to speed it up. You know, if I can't avoid it. I, <laughs> right. yeah. But I can yeah. squat. I can squat free weight. I can do leg press. I can do hack squats. I can do anything. Just always um, be mindful of the, so that the, the operated side is perfect. Just be mindful of the, the right side to not, you know, smash the hip, the hip bone with the thigh bone. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's just always, that's, that's the only thing I have to worry about. I mean, I, I remember um, seeing some of your old animal videos and stuff from like four or five years ago and stuff. Um, you, you, you are training a little bit. It looks like you're a little more cautiously, a little slower now, a little slower tempo on the leg training than what you did do. Although you were pretty controlled and slow to begin with, but it's a lot slower now, at least, at least it seems. Is that something that you're consciously doing too to kind of monitor that hip? Yes, because what I'm trying to do is when I, when I descend into anything, mm-hmm. I want to make sure, first of all, the, the operated side, when I'm at the very bottom, like when I'm sitting in a deep squat, even without weight, yeah. it feels a little at the very, very bottom. If I really force it down, okay, it feels a little unstable, a little, gotcha. little bit like you know you get you have the 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 thing where it goes into the hip and then the femur bone, and yeah. when I'm at the very bottom, it feels like it could go like this, you know, slip out. Gotcha. Yeah, and I have I, I can control that muscularly by you know going down slow, stopping, and then flexing back up instead gotcha. of going down bouncing. Because right. I'm, I'm always I'm worried if I bounce, it's gonna you know <laughs> right. gonna it's gonna like, be on you. Like, yeah, yeah, and because actually I have dislocated it once, the operating oh. side after surgery. I have dislocated it once in in my sleep so i i slept i, I fell asleep on my side yeah. you know, as always and then somehow i turned onto my stomach and my blanket was underneath me so it was wrapped around my you know i, I, I turned yeah. onto my blanket so my leg was wrapped in the yeah. blanket and i i woke up and i figured oh fuck and then I tried to pull the blanket out from under me, like half asleep, you know, and not flexing, not tense. I just, I ripped my leg out with it. Oh, how and did that feel? You know, <laughs> it feels, imagine when you crack your finger like this. Yeah. But this big joint does that. Okay. So yeah. It, it slipped that's out. A big, that's a big joint too. Mm-hmm. So I know what my shoulder felt like every time it slipped out on me. This one when it used to slip out, and I can't imagine your fucking hip coming out of socket. And then, you know, you lie there and you think, "Fuck," because at that point your leg is just hanging. Right. There's no control over anything. Yeah. So I woke up my wife and I told her, "You got to call an ambulance." Imagine three o'clock in the morning, we're sat, we're sleeping like. Like right. That, yeah. You gotta call an ambulance. She's like, what? What? what what's going on? You gotta call a fucking ambulance. <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <laughs> so we call an ambulance. They count. They come to the second floor uh, bedroom. Yeah. Three people. And they give they give me the whole what's happened. Blah blah. Okay. Are you taking any illegal drugs? And I told him I take testosterone and shit. Like that's gonna do anything about my hip. You know? yeah, it's not gonna yeah. help them at all, yeah. Yeah. So they they give me a little bit of fentanyl to make me relax. Yeah. But I was pretty relaxed. I was lying in bed. I, I knew what was gonna happen. The only problem at this point is how do we get this guy, who is already back up to 270 almost, from the second floor to the <laughs> to the ambulance outside. <laughs> And we have staircases like this, you know, right? Those sp- spiral, spiral staircase, yeah. And I can't walk. And there's there's two women, two, um, you know, EMT women and a and a guy that doesn't look strong at all. So they call the fire department. 
right. fire department comes, eight guys, eight guys in full gear, you know, jackets, boots, and everything. And they considering, well, do we take him out the window with the crane? <laughs> Or do, are we trying to get him down the stairs? Yeah? That we're doing. We, we're not doing the crane thing at four in the morning, with the whole neighborhood watching. You know, we got to get me down the stairs somehow. So they they have like some kind of a rescue, like a it's a it's a blanket made out of yeah. rubber. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they carry me down the stairs. Eight people carry me down the stairs. I'm in this. I'm in this blanket thing like this, right down the spiral staircase. They put me in the ambulance. That was that was fucked up, man. That was fun. They put me in the ambulance, and then they have to uh, sedate you fully, like on a surgery. And when I woke up, my leg was back in. They told me, "Okay, you can go home now." I went, and there was a train. I trained that day, just like nothing ever happened. <laughs> Yeah. I can't that imagine was... the two female paramedics that showed up <laughs> mm-hmm. and see him in that bed. And we gotta try to get him down the stairs. You know, you know what naked. they were thinking. Sleep naked. Sleep naked. <laughs> you know, it just occurred to me though is you don't have three hundred pound men in Europe very often, right? No, we don't have any. It's it's not like here where the half the population is obese, mm-hmm. right? So it was it was very special for them. They, they don't, you know, anything, any equipment in the in, in hospitals and all that shit. For example, I go to the hospital, they they measure my blood pressure. Apparently, and, and then they're like, oh, this cuff is too small, we gotta get the bigger cuff. And they they get a bigger cuff, but they actually they take it out of the package for the first time. So they have to, you know, open a new new carton. They rip the plastic off. So they have never had any anyone with a 20 inch arm in the, and the hospital has been there for forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very this is very special for people over here. There's no no matter what, if, if I sit on a chair in the hospital, it almost breaks, and all, all that shit. Like that, you know. So That's it's awesome. it's it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. I, I, I kind of I'm kind of upset that they didn't try to bring you out the window with a crane though, because that's oh. <laughs> that's a hell of a story. I would want to see that at four o'clock in the morning. See that video <laughs> coming out of the gurney, all, hanging from a all crane. The, all the neighbors, man. And, oh, so I didn't want that. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure they were coming over for two weeks afterwards trying to find out what happened. And I'm sure you know they're nosy as shit. Mm-hmm. My mom had to explain to everyone. Yeah. So, uh, that's. Oh. That was after the second the second hip surgery, right? You you so that's after because yeah. you have you've, you've had it done twice. So the first time, obviously, you you had the infection and were in the hospital and in a coma for a couple of days, and then you had to have it operated on again. Yeah. So this is how. Yeah. How long ago was that that you dislocated it? Uh, that was we had the second surgery in on t- February twenty second, mm-hmm. and I dislocated it about six weeks after that. So it you think still, it just wasn't quite healed up? Yes, the the, the doctor said that the, the capsule around the joint it's, it's, it probably hasn't been tight enough yet. So, yeah. and then they you know what he wanted to give me he wanted to prescribe me like a uh, like a half body like a cast to wear all the time in order to make sure it doesn't slip out again. So right. I took the, I, I said oh yes we're gonna do that that's a great idea yeah I took the prescription. And never, you never, never got. Yeah. It. And every time I had to go back for another, for another appointment, checkup appointment, it's like, are you wearing the cast? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, of course I'm wearing the cast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just today I couldn't. Yeah, I, I took it off to, to come in. So yeah, I'd be, yes. yeah, be accessible. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, <laughs> oh. So they wanted to put half your body in a cast. Just so your legs stayed in one place. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a around the hip, like a belt around the oh. hip, and then a plastic cast that goes down my leg in order to make sure that my hip stays in place. All that was, I would have had to wear that 24 hours. 
I think How that's a great idea. Bathroom? That doesn't even make sense. Yeah, pro- I don't know. I didn't. Well, I didn't. How? <laughs> if they don't have, thought. if they don't have big enough blood pressure cuffs, how the how fuck are they going to get a cast that's big enough for his leg? They right. were going to make one special. They yeah. had actually. <laughs> yeah. I had an appointment yeah, set up. Over here, that costs a hundred grand to have them custom mold you a plastic <laughs> leg cast. And then yeah, the company would reject it, and you'd get a bill for a hundred grand. Yeah. After it doesn't fit, <laughs> it's like the doctor. The doctor told me. The doctor told me this is a, this is a very expensive prescription. So you are gonna. So make sure you treat it right. So yeah. And I, I never, I never. Yeah, I wouldn't even bother with that. Yeah. Because it didn't, you know, it didn't, I didn't hurt it. I didn't, it didn't slip out when I was training or anything. I just made a, a dumb move. Yeah. Well, and it wasn't healed all the way either. It was only six months yeah. post-surgery. So, you know, I hadn't properly healed yet. It was only going to get better from that point naturally on its own anyway. That's why I asked how long out. I mean, if it was like four months later and I did it, I'd be like, I'd be scaring me when I trained. But it was six weeks after. And at this point, you haven't had any issues since other than it feels a little unstable at the bottom of a squat. But. Yeah, when I put four and a half plates on. Yeah, with the four and a half plates on the fucking bar, though, too. Maybe I'll put a commercial in there. Todd Todd was asking about my day today. Uh, When I take a day off, got to be honest, I eat a lot of food. I eat a lot of food all the time. So it's it gets to a point where I eat so much food. When I get up in the morning, I actually already feel kind of a performance anxiety. Because I know... I know, oh, this is what I have to do today. Not yeah. the training, because the training is fun, but eating all that food is, is like, oh, fuck that. So when I have a take, when I take a day off, I actually, I eat what I want. So that's one day a week, I eat what I want. And mm-hmm. it's, I know it's a lot less than I'm normally eating. Sometimes I eat something not considered clean, but basically that day off, gives my stomach and my digestion a rest mm-hmm. and I really if I could if I if I just kept on eating and eating and eating without days off it would just be I, I couldn't handle it I couldn't my my digestion couldn't handle it so when I started implementing that that day off from eating um I just made everything feel better I found that to be the case, too, is I've got the same problem you have. I don't eat as much as you, but like in 2021 off season, I was probably doing 300, 400 protein a day, a thousand carbs a day. And trying mm-hmm. to, and I'm also a low fat dieter. You yeah. know, it's because I believe if I'm not mistaken, you were eating 400 protein, 100, 1200 carbs and 50 grams of fat. Was that accurate? Yeah, that's about accurate. I, I did a, a full day of eating video on my it, channel. It was almost 10,000 calories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's a, but that's not an, that, that wasn't the special day. That was, that's a regular day. Yeah. <laughs> Your special day, even if you have pizza and ribs and still would be pasta, hard. you're still not eating as many calories. You can, no. You eat three cheap meals, but it's still going to be half the calories because you're just not hungry when you wake up. Yeah, yeah. You just, I just basically, I probably on those days I probably eat twice, like yeah. one one smaller meal, and then at night whatever I want, you know, just some yeah. like you said, some, some pasta, sometimes sometimes what, pizza or sub, subway, something like that. What I've yeah. noticed too is the guys that have fast metabolisms tend to have less appetite in general. I have a good appetite, I think. I think I have a good appetite, but I, your appetite, well, it, if there, it, is the, the chicken first or the egg first? You know, if, if you have a good, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you have a good appetite, yeah, but you have to fucking pound yourself with food all the time, your appetite is eventually going to get yeah, worse. It, worse but if you're never getting to eat to the point where you're really stuffed and full 
your appetite is always going to be higher. So, you know. Yeah. yeah. When, yeah that's When you were a kid, though, like when you didn't lift yet, when you were less like a teenager before you started lifting, did were you a big eater or were, yes. you, were you a skinny kid and a big eater? I was a skinny kid. I had, I had different faces. First, I was a big eater. I was I was a big eater, and I got I I even got a little fat. Okay, so I had some I had some some belly fat hanging down and all that over my belt. But then I got into my my mom put me to a um, a boarding housing school. Okay, but it's not like a haha vacation yeah. Harry Potter Harry Potter type, you know. Boarding <laughs> It's a little was a little rougher, and the food there wasn't as good, and I didn't feel well. I I didn't feel comfortable there. I had no friends and all that, so I all I did was play basketball, and not eat, not eat enough to compensate for the extra activity. And of course, my grandmother wasn't there anymore to feed me and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> so I. The lowest I went to when I was when I was 14, 15, when I started lifting at 15, I was 511 also and about 220, 125, 125 pounds. Oh my god. 11. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you could see my wow. you could see my, my my ribs on the back and all that, you know, my <laughs> 125. And when I when I just when I discovered bodybuilding and I started eating the way I read in the magazines and all that, I blew up. I gained muscle. Even even the first six months without any eating, I already first six months I put on like 25 pounds. Then I discovered how to eat. My cousin was a personal trainer. He told me, yeah, you know, take some creatine and here's protein powder and all that. And then Within eight weeks, I put up put on another twenty five pounds, so I was already fifty pounds up in, in the first um, the first stage of my training. Right. And at that point, I thought, man, I'm a monster. I went from one twenty five <laughs> to one seventy five. <laughs> I'm jacked. Yeah. I, I, at that point, I looked normal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then it just you know, it's went, funny. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, then it just, it just, you know, I, I learned more about training. I learned more about nutrition. I, okay, I, had, I went from from five meals to six meals, and I learned more about protein, and started implementing better training techniques. Split split up my training more into into one body part per workout. Then I read the in, had the Arnold Encyclopedia. Started training twice a day, you know, before school and after school and all that shit. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. I, I just enjoyed what I did, and I ate. Yeah. And I I did. That was that's the that's the most important thing. I think that's missing today. When I when I hear people talk or or when I hear what when when young people start out, they are. What's the best way? What's what they, they they think more about um the science and what is the best way and how much how much this and how many sets and how much RPE and how many reps in reserve and you know um is is it better to push pull legs or if I'm natural I don't know you know all these stupid questions I just I had this information in a book Arnold's Encyclopedia for example or Flex magazine. So I read what was what they said there. I did everything to the best of my ability. I ate to the best of my ability, and I had fun doing it. I didn't worry about, yeah. you know, it, anything. And the other thing is, I was never afraid of doing too much. Right. You know, these days it's like, oh, what if I'm getting overtrained? Fuck you not. If you're 16, 17, 18, 20 years old, you're not gonna get overtrained no matter what no. you do. I have never, I have never seen anyone train too hard to build muscle. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, there's no such thing as training too hard. Oh man, 
I did three forced reps on this one. I'm probably not going to grow. Right. I could have only <laughs> done <laughs> could have only done one forced rep. It's like, ugh. Yeah. You know, you you brought up a great point though when you when you said about the fact that you you started growing and you weren't even eating right. You put on 25 pounds as soon as you started training. And I think yeah. that people forget, and here's 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 what people forget. They forget how much genetics plays a role. And they don't even find out how what their genetics are yet as far as for, for growth and training before they try to do anything else. You put on 50 pounds with barely knowing how to eat and just training because you enjoyed doing it because you liked it. And you put 50 pounds on in, in you know a couple of months. Eight, yeah. And the first thing, yeah, and the first thing that these kids do now is is that they're they're asking about what their first cycle should be and they haven't even touched a weight yet. Mhm, mhm. Is it better? You know, is it, should I? What what should I stack with my testosterone? <laughs> right. or you know, <laughs> you should right you should have hair on your dick for more than ten years first before before you even think about doing it. Because if you're twenty years mm-hmm. old, twenty one years old, you don't need gear anyway. You got enough hormones flowing through your system that if you just eat and train hard every day, you're gonna get better. You're gonna grow. Yes, and and consistently. Because I went to the gym when when I decided. Actually, that's. I decided the first day I went to the to the little weight lifting room we had in the boarding school there. Right. I decided I was going to be a professional bodybuilder. I said I'd, I had I found a flex magazine, found a flex magazine it had Kevin LeBron on the cover, and I was like, what the fuck? What the fuck? You can look like this? This is actually <laughs> this is not not this is not Photoshop or something. I'm going to do that. And that day I decided I'm going to do anything I can do in order to, uh, so everything I can do in order to look like that. Right. And there was no more, probably during my, my whole life, I've been drunk three times, three times, twice. I was really drunk. And one time I was a little queasy, but that's all the partying I did. Right. My whole life. And I went to bed at the same time, even on the weekends, I got my six meals in every day, every day. It didn't matter. No matter where I was, I, I brought food, even if my friends laughed at me and I never took a shortcut Right from, from the, from the day I decided I was going to do that. And yeah, that's, that's basically how, how it worked and how it should be done, I guess, and not just people worry about oh, what what gear am I gonna take and what, what uh, right. you know, it's just uh, it, it's annoying yeah. to be honest these days. Yeah. How how old were you when you started taking gear? I was eight. 17, 18, somewhere, somewhere around. Eighteen. There. So you'd already been training for about four years at that point. No, no, two years. Two years. Okay. Be with you. But two years and you. Though, I, but I, I went at that point. I had already put on 90 pounds. Right. <laughs> That's what, that was my next question: Is how how much weight did you already put on without it? 90 pounds. Yeah. Okay. So I was 200 and about 215 or something like that. So I mm. went from 125 125 to 215, and I put my first cycle was I bought 10 ampules of the Greek the Greek Decas from Norma with you know, six, <laughs> 200 10 milligrams. Ampules. Yeah, yeah, I took one a week for 10 weeks and I put on another 25 pounds. <laughs> so then I was about two, um, 40. 240, yeah. yeah. So just to two, clarify, two, you did 30 something, 240, yeah. So you yeah. didn't use testosterone base. So this is like a running theme of this podcast. You were using <laughs> DACA as your primary anabolic agent and you relied on your natural body to produce some testosterone. Is that correct? Or you just uh, I didn't think about that. I just heard Lee Priest in an interview say that his first cycle was DECA, one a week for ten weeks. And I figured, well, that's my favorite bodybuilder. <laughs> I'm going to do so if it works did. for Lee, it's going to work for me. <laughs> so what's funny is it's the simplest way of thinking, and it's often all that's necessary. 
Right. Is yeah. I'm going to read Flex magazine. I'm going to eat six meals a day until I get the scale weight goes up, and I'm going to do a very basic cycle that a very a successful pro did. And it's always way less than the average Instagram physique oh. model is using. And it's just 200 deca a week for 10 weeks, and it worked just just fine. I, I the funny thing is. Or- 19 that take more than I take more than me and it's their first cycle and they're like well this is what I wanted to do and I'm like no <laughs> no <laughs> no that's dumb there's no coming back fun- from that yeah the funny thing is I was stronger the day after I took the first shot you know just mentally yeah was, placebo effect right I woke up in the morning I can remember that I woke up in the morning I was in the shower and I felt like a, I felt a, the a hunger sensation, like, like because I hadn't had breakfast yet. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is already working. I'm more hungry than normal. I'm more hungry. <laughs> already working. <laughs> and when I went to went to train for the first time, all my lifts, all my lifts went up. Even the even the, the wrist curls, because I trained forearms, even those went up, like significantly. Yeah. <laughs> and then. One more thing with the with the what people you know, um, I just did the most simple thing. I also didn't get any deca dick or any anxiety or any other side effects because I simply didn't know about them. Exactly. Every time I have someone who is a virgin to steroids and they're like insisting on using gear, and like I'll be like, okay. So Anavar is a good first step. You know, it's yes. like the training wheels, the water wings of steroids. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, they're insisting on using injectables. It's like, okay, let's use DEC, like NPP. And mm-hmm. then after that, they're on DECA for a while. And then if they really want to go further, it's like one unit of GH, basically taking advantage of a placebo effect at that point. And then mm-hmm. it's like six months later, they're like, yeah, this guy at the gym told me about this DECA dick. And I was like, and they're like, Mom, I'm worried that my dick isn't what it should be. I was like, <laughs> that's the problem. You're worried. <laughs> I was like, Do you say that? And it's like, well, my girlfriend started complaining. I'm like, did you tell her about Decadic? And they're like, well, yeah. I was like, she's just abusing you mentally. She's just getting in your head <laughs> to cut you down about your dick. It's just to be a bitch. And then mm-hmm. they're, they're like, I was like, she didn't complain about your dick before you told her about Decadic, dick, did you? And they're like, no. I'm like, does your dick work for porn? And they'll be like, yeah. I was like, it just doesn't work while she's insulting you. And then they're like, yeah. I was like, it's because your girlfriend's a bitch. I was like, it's not because of drugs. It's because <laughs> a different girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> before she started treating you like that. Right. Yeah. I, that's the thing. I, so I knew I was going to get stronger taking that. So the day after I took it, I was stronger. But if I also had known about anxiety from DECA and uh, prolactin and all that, I would have had all those side effects as well. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. Right. Yep. The no stable effect. Mm-hmm. My, uh, <laughs> my, first, my first cycle was just Anadrol. That's all it was. Mm-hmm. It was Anadrol, 50 milligrams of Anadrol a day. And it was real Anadrol because I could be like laying on the couch and I'd have like a pump. My chest was like full and it just felt full and it was just full of water. And so was my face. Um, <laughs> you know, that's how I knew it was real shit. But I think my second one was actually, I think it was, it was Deca and Anadrol. And that's all it mm-hmm. was. It was like, it was like, I think it was 200 milligrams of Deca a week and 50 milligrams of Anadrol a day. And I'm pretty sure I put on about 25 pounds from that. It was basically yeah, real that, basic. I didn't start getting into anything bigger until I actually started competing. That guy's great. I think, you know, it's like a commercial here, but. <laughs> yeah. This no, I, I, like, I like that guy. commercial. Because uh, I was, yeah, I'm like, I it's love Deco. Deco. I'm not, I haven't used Deco in a few months, but I've been, I've met, for years, I used Deco only. And then would just throw up either Tren or Anavar or Tren and Anavar a tiny amount on top of it. And that was mm-hmm. it. And I'd be like four, 1,400. I would have like 1,000 deca to 1,400 deca and throw in 100 to 200 Tren and a, a 25 Anavar pre-lift. And I put on a size just fine, never had any problems. Blood work was fantastic. 
I think it's the, the addition of the testosterone that actually, you know, people that, that run run it with the testosterone is where the problem where they start having all the issues with the deca dick and stuff because then it does um, suppress some of the testosterone, your natural test and stuff. When you start running too much over the top of it, you get all the suppression and then you get nothing else. And so if it's not in your system full go, you're going to start having issues with it where you start having the deca dick issues and stuff. If you just run deca by itself, you're probably fine. That's what I thought. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, because I've had people too. Like you, I've Todd, I've seen you, you. You, you've even said this. And if you if you even start using any testosterone at all while you're on the deca, you start having having all the side effects of the deca. Mm-hmm. But if you don't run any testosterone, you're you're you can fourteen hundred fucking deca is not not causing any issues anywhere. Nothing, no prolactin buildup, no nothing. So yeah. it's got to be the combination of running, um, running a test space with it, you know, or any test at all for that matter that yeah. causes ninety percent of those issues. So. Oh. So you were you were pretty basic then for 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 the longest time. I can't imagine you take that much anymore now, even just because of the fact that you know you are a pro and you have you know the elite genetics that most of us don't. I think that's the biggest misconception on that too is that people think think that the biggest guys are taking the most amount of shit. And really, what really what it comes down to is this, usually the smallest guys are taking the most amount of shit because they think that's what it takes to get big. And they don't realize that there's a genetic component to that, not only your natural genetics, but how you genetically respond to anything exogenous that you put in your system. So I've got to be honest, I had, of course, I had my moments. Sure, we all have. Yeah. But when it, I'm a big, when it comes to like insulin, you know, shuttling carbs and trying to put on, putting on weight like that. I've actually, I actually am a fan of, yeah. I don't know if, if it's higher because 20 units before training, 20 units after training is, is, is a good range mm-hmm. that I enjoy, that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. It depends on what, what I'm training. If I'm doing biceps, yeah. I'm going to do 20 yeah. units before. <laughs> <You're seeing laughs> yeah. Be hypo. Yeah. You'll be hypo in a second. <laughs> no, the, 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 the amount of Just, carbs you have to uh, take in to compensate for those 20 units before yeah. and after you're never going to use the, those right. training biceps. So right. that would be like for a back workout or a leg workout. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Right. But um, when it comes to steroids, I have tried higher dosages. I've tried, for example, on test, like a 10 milliliter vial a week. So t- 2,500 milligrams with uh, a vial of uh, Boulder known a week, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was high. It's a four and a half yeah. times. But I tried that for three weeks maybe, and I did not notice any difference, like at all. Yeah. Except for maybe a little bit more bloat. Not even that, you know, just a little... And, and I thought, man, this is, I'm going to go back to my uh, three times a week, 250, and three, three times a week, 200 of the bolt gnome. So 750 yeah. and 600. Yeah. And exactly the same result. Yeah. Exactly the same result. The irony so is right, yeah. that almost everybody. And I mean, everybody has pretty much the same protocol, which is 750 test, 600 bold and own in the off season, and then mm-hmm. pre-contest, 50 trend, 50 probe, 50 master on 50 winstrol a day. Yes. It's pretty, it wouldn't be so popular because it's not like people are doing it because they would want to do more. And then they almost always revert back to these lower doses. It must be because it is body mass dependent. That yes. it is a function of your total kilogram. Otherwise, everyone wouldn't be using almost exactly the same doses. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mine, mine are pretty much the same. It's the off season when I, when I blast, it's 1,000 sustenon and 600 EQ. Yeah. And that's, like, and that's what, it. What I, I do. And then I add. And then I just what uh, I do is like go ahead. every other day. For example, you do every other day injections just because it's easier. Yeah, and then it yeah. comes out to to eight seventy five mm-hmm. test. Yeah, seven hundred 
whatever mm -hmm. stack with it. Yeah. And sometimes I do three things, uh, a little bit of inject injectable dianable, injectable mm -hmm. like injectable better, but that's um, fifth, um, 25 every day milligrams injectable. Yeah. But I also do that for um, only every other day. So 50 every other day because I don't want to pin a fucking needle in me because of a half like a pin cushion. Yeah, I have to see of that. So, right. but but that's basically what it goes down to. Then, um, most people take tops from what I've heard, ten units of GH tops between six and ten. Yeah, it depends mm -hmm. on some, somewhere around there. Or if they have this, uh, if they have eighteen IU vials, they take nine. Yeah, sure. Just something easy or Sarah's they easy. take they take eight. You know, four and four, something like that. So basically, what what Todd said, everyone is doing the same shit. Yeah, they're all doing. You know? I mean, and I think the, the GH the dose too. It depends. The GH dose depends on. I think that just depends more upon the size of your body and how much you know mass you have. But it also depends on the type of GH you're using and what 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 kind it is. If you're using like a generic somatotropin, you might have to use more to get the same results as you would with a uh, pharma grade, you know, serostim. Or if you're using, uh, uh, you know, some of the other ones, like they have the the gynotropin or some of those other ones, they might be mm -hmm. just a little bit different. Different depending on the, the type of GH that you're using, you might have to be a little bit more or a little bit less. Yeah. You know, but I mean, yeah, everybody's doing the same fucking shit. I mean, pre-contest, it's like 300 milligrams of Tren a week, 300 milligrams of Master on a week, and some fucking Anavar, you know. <laughs> And Winster, which I, which I fucking hate at the end, just just to get that cortisol block effect and try to you know pull some of the water out of the joints. Yeah, yeah. When I when I do it, it's my, funny, stack is all, my stack is I I think I started um, um, sticking to long acting esters even in the pre contest phase. Mm -hmm. So I basically keep the test the test the same, and then I add also. Um, Mostly the last six weeks I do Winstrol uh, pills because I don't like the injections yeah. too, you know, yeah. too too risky. Like easy to, yeah, too easy to get an infection. Mm -hmm. then, you can drink that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I've done it. It gives you heartburn, but you can do it. It's more expensive then, you know. <laughs> and then Tren, 50 a day. And for example, when I won my pro card, I was really shredded. I was really, really shredded. I didn't even use any Mastron. Just those three, yeah. And wow. no Anavar, no, no nothing. That's, and I was really, really dry. I was. Yeah, yeah I th that's why I want. I think there's there's a component to that where to, to the drier look guys are probably using a lot fucking less because there's a lot less shit in your system that's kind of counteracting each other. That if you mm -hmm. stick to a basic two or three compounds, you're probably going to have your 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 driest look on stage, hardest driest look, regardless. I think so. Yeah, I think I think three things is is three things and then an anti-estrogen mm -hmm. is, is, is probably all, every, all, all you need. Yeah. Then, of course, at the end, people start feeling uh, guilty. Like, oh, man, maybe I should add some halo test in. Maybe I should do this <laughs> and that. Because what if anyone else does it? Right, you know, right, right. And that's that's starts in your own head. You know? mm -hmm. But, for example, the one time I took halo test in, uh, Indianapolis for the last week. The only thing that I got from it was indigestion, heartburn, and it kind of made my stomach bloated. I couldn't eat, you know, when I was yeah. bloating. And I'm not gonna do that again. <laughs> yeah. It was it was pill form, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just said I don't know what it is with some orals, but I, I have to be with the orals and stuff. They, they cause me a lot of fucking heartburn and indigestion and stuff. I used to love, love Anadrol and I can't use Anadrol in the off season if I want to eat now. So it's the only one that I can use that like even in the off season, it doesn't bother my stomach is Anabar. That's it. Every, all the other orals just fuck my stomach right up. Have you tried uh, Anadrol before bed only with your last meal? No. That's, a, that's one I... That I can do that for some time. Yeah, give us time um, to get through. Yeah, you t you take it with your last meal, and you wake up in the morning, you're really full, and you know, <laughs> and 
by by that time it's already been through your stomach so you can eat the next day right so that that's yeah. not a bad idea <laughs> yeah yeah it's oh time. man i'll have to try that next off season <laughs> <laughs> when i can actually train again oh yeah how, how so how is that now you just um so you're just gonna wait till it heals I told Justin I would try to train tomorrow and see how it feels because I tried doing, I tried last week one day and it and it was felt okay doing back, but the next day, my I couldn't even lift my fucking right arm up more than two or three mm -hmm. inches. So, it's I mean it's super spinatus right. So it's this this action right here when I get to right here it's really really stiff and it's really really tight. But I've got shoulder tendonitis as well, so I should just be able to that that's that ligament there is for is for deducting mm -hmm. the arm over the top of the head and I can go back behind my back and that's okay. So it's not the infra, uh, infraspiratus. It's not that, but there's tendonitis built up in the shoulder as well. He said, I've got, got, I've got some rotator cuff tendonitis because of the tear. He said he actually thought it was torn for a while mm -hmm. and I just didn't realize it until I started getting leaner and the joint and everything started getting drier. That's where the tendonitis started to really set in and I could feel it. And that's, that was actually what was hurting was the tendonitis, not the actual ligament. Okay. I thought there was something wrong, so we did the MRI, and he did the MRI, and he goes, yeah, you're 75% torn. <laughs> I can see it right here. So he doesn't think I need surgery. He doesn't think it's going to get any worse, but he said it's just a matter of being able to deal with the pain of the tendonitis right now until that goes away. So I, I'm just trying BPC-157. It's better now. It doesn't throb right now. Like I'm just sitting here like like last week. It was just throbbing sitting here like this. I, can feel I, it probably, would have gotten, I probably would have gotten a cortisone shot. You know. yeah you know i don't want to do that though because there's dangers of, of tearing yeah. something worse after the fact right yeah. so i i thought i'll just you know i'll just do the bpc 157 um we'll try that for a couple of weeks and if i can go back and resume training even 80 percent in the next week or so then we'll just we'll go from there and like if i i don't i don't need to get any bigger i just need to maintain what i have and get peeled so i can do that in you know 10 or 11 yeah. weeks and as long as i can train my shoulders somewhat you know, and train chest, I'll be okay. Because that was the only thing that bothered it was chest and, and shoulders. I can train arms, mm -hmm. I can train legs, obviously. And even back training, doing rowing movements didn't bother. It's when I was doing, I went in and did a back with movement. So the pull down movement and trying to get my arm overhead took me a second. Oh, yeah, 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 it, yeah. Was, it wasn't pulling down that hurt. It was on the way back up, the recoil. That's what mm -hmm. hurt. Because mm -hmm. it was pulling on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah we'll be all right. I mean, I've got I've got a couple weeks here to figure out what I want to do. It just sucks because I had two shows lined up first that I wanted to do at the end of May and the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there's this cool trick for the lad for mm -hmm. no active motion. If you do thumb up and come up like this, and then at this point I can't come up any higher without internally rotating. So mm -hmm. I feel if you were to lean back, depending on what cable or machine you're using come up to here without thoracic extension just keep your abs tight and brace mm -hmm. bring your thumb up and then bring your elbow down kind of like those one arms we did together at royal yeah, oak yeah but yeah. Mm -hmm. back at the hips not the waist then you might be able to functionally train that lat without aggravating that shoulder i i cool. do that movement on a hammer strength machine um the same way i do it on the on the high row hammer strength and i just grab a i, I get a d handle and put it over there and I sit I down do low and I pull down. I can I do that one on my back thickness day because I actually do the one with movement just to get everything loosened up. And then I go, go into all rowing movements after that. I do that, but I haven't tried to do that because I was just trying to see if I could do any kind of like light pull downs and stuff, even at 50 percent. Like, I mean, 120 pounds on a, on a pull down. It was just killing me on the way up. I, I got like four sets in. I said, OK, fuck this. I'm going home. <laughs> There's no way I can't do this. This, this aches. And I, the next day I couldn't lift my arm. Uh -huh. so, but it, I tried too soon also. That, uh, by what I did this season and where I didn't make a lot of progress at first, but I went through and I relearned how to activate and train every muscle as slow and deliberate as possible and which mm -hmm. exercise to activate that muscle the best. And then mm -hmm. I pretty much focused all the training on just one set to failure with the best exercises. And then the progression is adding volume by one set every week to her body part. Right. So right. You, know, you got three quad movements. You do one set for all three quad movements, not just three. And then you go through and add a fourth set. So a second set to the least 
the highest yield one. So let's say it's leg extension is the highest yield, right? So mm-hmm. you do a, stack, a back offset on the leg extension. Then the, the third week, you add a fifth set, a second set to like squats. And then on the fourth week, you add a second set to um, leg press. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so that gives you the three highest yield movements doing the most effective tempo for that movement with the mo- best range of motion for that movement using the minimum amount of volume. And now I'm growing on less gear and less food by doing less right. volume, which you've been telling me for 10 years. But I've the been point telling is, you that for 10 years, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point is I've always been like, oh, you're being a pussy. You can do another set. And it's like I could, but it's not as efficient. And it's mm-hmm. like Roman said, you don't grow. Nobody trains too hard, but they can train too much. Much, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Burning too many That's calories right. up, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, he he has the same issue you do, Roman. That he has a just a huge fast metabolism that he can't mm-hmm. eat enough to support it. So when he was doing for years, he was doing this ultra high volume. He'd be in the gym for two and a half hours, you know. And he trained yeah. twice a day for a little while too, didn't you, Todd? Yeah. yeah, there was some like counts that were four hours. Yeah, and they and weren't. He'd end up burning up all the calories that he was taking in. That was the problem. It that was my problem. Yeah, fourteen hundred leg press, nine hundred pound squats, five hundred pound squats after two hours. So the first two <laughs> hours was the isolation <laughs> to loosen up the joints, were in so much pain from lifting so heavy. But the <sighs> reps themselves weren't that good. It was mm-hmm. just. Right resistance without any of the accounting for um internal tension on the muscle yeah Yeah. and i wasn't controlling i was controlling the negative but they weren't slow negatives there was no pauses at the bottom there was no pauses at contraction yeah yeah i get it yeah, I've got to start. I mean, I I know I got to start slowing my tempo and stuff down now I, with the, with the injuries and shit. And I'm getting older, so which I it sucks because I enjoy training really hard and really heavy with a with a, a moderate tempo, not a slow tempo, because that's more fun to me. So it's, yeah. it's really boring to me. Like the way you squat, Roman, I couldn't do that because I'd I'd fall asleep doing it. I mean, it just gets boring. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. But I'm you know I'm gonna have to start doing that with like my shoulder, my chest movements and stuff, and in the back probably now because of the the injury over. I don't want to cause any more problems. I have no problem from the waist down. My knees are fine, my hips are fine, everything down there is fine. I had twelve mm-hmm. and a half last year, but that was more of a freak freak accident. But that's healed now too, so I uh, I can still train like an idiot when it comes to legs. Go back yeah. and watch your leg training video from last month, man. Even though I'm training super slow, I'm still suffering like a motherfucker at the end of each of those sets. I know you. Yeah. You, you, ta- you he tapped out. <laughs> he tapped out during leg press. He was like, I can't do any more. <laughs> yeah, I was. Fine. That was my second leg workout that week too. I will give myself a little bit of credit. Oh, oh he's fine. Uh, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. That was I sent quick. It to voice. I sent it to voicemail. <laughs> you fucking idiots! Tell these people to fuck off, man. Yeah, it's well, just I gotta like, why are you so? There's dumb? a way to turn off don't my turn me. off my ringer so it doesn't ring, but I don't know how to do it. So whatever. But yeah. So no, I yeah. Have you, you didn't see that, did you, Roman? Did you watch that video? No. I have to send, no. It, to, I have to, I have to send it to you. It's on YouTube. We had Jeff Sigo record us. Uh, oh, at, Ken cool. Jack, at, at Ken Jackson's gym. Yeah. There's nobody. There's nobody in there. It's just us. And it's dead awesome. silent, no music, nothing. <laughs> it's such a good gym. He has shit pre-banded. It's like yeah. you, it's like Meadows grew, and it's like it, the best equipment on the planet. And Meadows went through and hand personalized everything to be perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We looked at the leg extension too. We're like, oh, it's already banded for us. We don't have to do it. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. Well, there's the one part in there where we're doing the, we're doing the pendulum squat because neither one of us get to do pendulum squat. So we're like, fuck it, we're gonna use it because he's got one of the arsenal pendulums in there, a brand new one. Mm-hmm. It's not bolted to the floor. So <laughs> I damn near tipped it over a couple of times. <laughs> Todd's behind it. I'm like, you probably don't want to stand back there in case this thing goes. Cause we only had a 110 pound girl on the fucking front of it, trying to stand on the front of it to keep it on the floor. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, Karina was standing on one side of it to hold it down, and I was on the other side of it stabilizing the pendulum part of it so that <laughs> it, it was smooth so he didn't get stuck at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that uh, was- I, trained, I trained with my wife. She's my, so far, the best trading partner I've had in, in my life because yeah. she just, you know, she, she, she is n- not at all a cheerleader. She's the exact opposite of a cheerleader, you know? The only thing she does is when, when, when I get to the hard point of a set on a hex squad, for example, she's, she tells me like very, very quietly, like right next to my head, she's like, you can do one more. Like, like this, you can do one more. Then I'm going for one more. Then we can do one more. I do one yep. more. Yeah. But then we get to this point where she almost can't pull it up anymore. And then we stop. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. She has she struggles helping me with the getting the weight up. But there is no no screaming in my face, no you know, ridiculous uh, cheerleading yeah. and all that. And it's also when I when I when I when I start a session with war- warming up on the hack squad, and I'm like, oh man, I feel a little bit of pain in my hip or something like that. She's like, she she just shrugs her shoulders and says, yeah, you either do it or you don't. Yeah. Yeah. So either you, we're, we're gonna we're gonna train now, are we gonna train now or we're gonna leave it? Right. I'm like, oh. She's not like, oh man, your, your your hip hurts. Oh man, that's so sad. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we're either gonna do that or we're not gonna do that. So it's your decision. Yeah. There's no there's no um, feeling sorry for me, and there is also no, you know, cheering me up. She's just there. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're gonna train. We're gonna train. Is this, is this gonna happen or is it not gonna happen? That's it. The rest is the rest is up to me. She's gonna assist me, but the rest is up to me, and I like that. Yeah. When I when yeah. I look at Inst- when I look at Instagram and I see people train with their wives or their girlfriends, and they scream at them, you know, the, the wife screams at them like, "Fuck this!" I saw another one. I saw one guy on, on YouTube on, on on Instagram. He had apparently one female holding the camera because you could hear her. Work. You could hear her voice, and he has his girlfriend spot him on the hack squad, and they are both screaming at him like in a madhouse. Okay, two two women scream at you while you're doing a hack squad. I would just fuck this. I'm done. Like, I'd start laughing. Up. Yeah, <laughs> I'd start yeah. laughing. That's what I would do. Uh-huh. <laughs> you sound ridiculous. Wife, Knock it off. <laughs> that was <what's> me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like I don't like people screaming at me either. I'm not I'm not one of those that needs somebody to scream in their face. Um, I just I mean count the rep, help me count the reps, be there to, to you know get me a couple force reps and that's it. I I train by myself anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's, that, the benefits of training by yourself, you don't have to deal with that. So, on 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 legs, I gotta be honest, I like it I like it on legs. And I think since I've trained with my wife, since I've started training with her, my legs have improved, uh, improved. significantly. For the fact that I can do those More. last, those yep. last one or two reps, you know when you, you know when you get up to the to the last rep by yourself, and then you you wreck it because you know mm-hmm. I can't do you know I can't do another one. You know you yeah. after like after a, over a decade, you know there's no there's not another rep in here, but then you can go down and someone helps you just over that sticking point. Yeah, and and then another time over that sticking point, that has made a lot, a, a big difference in my um, growth this year. Sure. Yeah, I mean it has its benefits. I've just never found anybody that would be a consistent training partner because I, I go, yeah. I've tried and they just can't. They can't fucking. It, it's not the. It's not that I'm so strong that they can't, but they just. It's the consistency of being there in the gym having the intensity yeah. to train, being the consistency. They're either showing up fucking late all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Or yeah. they're tapping out halfway through or they're off doing something else and not paying attention. Or my my favorite one that I fucking hate is they're trying to do everything that I do. 
And if my strength level is up here and yours is down here, just do what you can do. We'll pull plates off. It's okay. You don't need to try to mm-hmm. do this and fucking hurt yourself. You know, yeah. you're not impressing me at all. It'd be more mm-hmm. impressive if you use half the weight and you do you do quality reps, you know, intense to failure. That's more impressive than you trying to do the same weight. I had one that he did that and I was just like, my God, we can't train together. This is this is terrible. <laughs> you're going to fucking you're going to hurt yourself and I'm going to be responsible. <laughs> I remember one of your videos, Roman, uh, where your wife was helping you on a hack squat. She was spotting you on a force trap, and then the sled stops. And then mm-hmm. you're like, more. And then it's yeah. like, it goes up a little bit, then it stops again. You're like, help me. And then she like, <laughs> she can't. I yeah. was like, that would have terrified me. Is that it's like, one thing if I'm doing force reps, but if we're doing force reps and you can't, then I'm like, well, if this ain't moving, this is going to tear. Because their force mm-hmm. has to go somewhere, and the weak link is now going to be my tendon. Yeah. That would have been there. <laughs> That was that was when we just started doing that. Okay? okay, so right now, that was literally when we just started doing that. Right now, she's much better. She is, you know, you know, at some point, <laughs> she's much better at it now. You know, at no, you know, spotting is is an art. At some yeah. point, you just you just know when to grab the bar and know how much to help and all that. And um, yeah, at that, I think that was that was. Literally the first or the, the second time or so we we did that together. Yeah. So right now it's it's just perfect. It's just she grabs it and it goes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it, spotting is an art form. You're you're right. You have to know how much how much tension to give give your partner and stuff and how much because I've seen people that are, like they'll grab they'll grab a barbell or they'll grab a hack squat and they pull and they just yank with everything they have and it's like you may have well just done a drop set because you got nothing out of that whatsoever. Exactly. You should only get one or two force reps at the very most if he's doing it right because you're using yeah. everything you have and they're literally taking ten pounds of resistance off just just enough to keep that bar moving. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not pulling it with everything you have. <laughs> it's like what what is the point unless they're dying underneath it. But we had, like Todd said, we had funny incidents. Uh, in the in the meantime, uh, the the hack squat goes up, and then it gets it gets it. I, I push with everything I have, right? And then it it goes down a little bit again. Like it, <laughs> it goes down two inches, and she re grabs it differently, and then it's like, ah, oh, that was that was scary, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And you and you have a Cybex hack squat, right? Yeah, yeah. that's a, yeah. so that fucking thing's like this. So there's no, <laughs> it's not like you know that I carry one where you're laying down and you can just kind of kick your feet out and kind of just let it go down and land on your butt. You're not doing that with a Cybex one. It's not happening. It's too steep. But then I afterwards, I'm always, I always, I always, uh, it's, I, I never get mad at her. I always smile. You know, it's it's because you know she helps me. I never, I would never, never in my life be like. What the fuck did you just do? You fucked up, uh, or, or make her make her feel bad in any way? Never, I mm-hmm. would never do that. And I just, you know, I'm just like, oh, yeah, that was different. That was a special kind of stimulation, you know, shock the muscle, right? You know, a little bit, go down a little bit, go up a little bit again. And yeah. You just, yeah. I would say the, the only times I've ever yelled at someone in the gym and felt bad about it later was if somebody was spotting me on an incline bench and they had no fucking idea what they were doing, Mm -hmm. I'll get up and I'm like, what the fuck was that? Like, I'm trying. I'm like, that was 300 pounds over my throat. If you don't know what you're doing and I ask you for a spot, say, sorry, I don't know how. Don't come over to help me and then almost kill me. So I was like, I'm just fucking Smith press. Like, I'm not, like, people are like, Supposed to do Smith press. It's like because none of you motherfuckers know how to spot. It's like if I don't have a consistent training partner, I'm life's on jeopardy if I'm doing this and somebody's coming over and people are like, I can't believe you let that girl spot you. I'm like, she cares if I die. You know, like she <laughs> right. like 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 her car payment is on the line here. So mm-hmm. she's gonna make sure that that car doesn't cut my head off. 
So yeah. like, even if they're a hundred pounds, they need to be strong. They need to be able to apply 10 to five pounds of the bar. Right. To let, so that if it starts to slow down dramatically, they can keep the velocity relatively the same. So it doesn't stick or one right. of your shoulders doesn't flare or the bar doesn't tip. Yeah. Yeah, just pretty think, much about about it. Body think about it. Marcus Rule's wife helped him, spotted him on a <laughs> on a on a twenty five hundred pound leg press. So in his video, he's she's spotting him. It's not like she's pushing up twenty five hundred pounds. It's over no. a ton, yeah. Or um, she spots him on a on a five plate uh, bench press. It's not like she's pulling that up. She's just like, you know, yeah, keeping it moving. Yeah. yeah, she was his training partner for probably his entire career. <laughs> yes, his, enti- his entire career. There was she one guy. Clearly didn't kill him. Told, yeah, he told he told the stories. One guy whose name was Mark, apparently. And I heard him say that in a seminar. And they were going crazy, you know, with the weights and all that. Sometimes he would just put weight on. He knew he couldn't do by himself. He knew he couldn't do one rep by himself. He just wanted to do three reps or so with a partner just to feel the weight. And then he said, yeah, this training partner, Mark, it only lasted like five or six years because afterwards he was broken and he, you know, <laughs> he, he wore him out. Literally. Yeah. I can see that. His videos, his videos, uh, his day in the life ones and stuff that he made back years ago are some mm-hmm. of my favorite ones where he's walking through the grocery store in Germany and everybody just fucking looking at him. <laughs> what is yeah. this mutant that's walking through the grocery store? Because yeah. he's like 350 pounds walking through the grocery store, yeah, lighting up a cigarette. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> on the uh, incline bench, on the incline bench with, with 365 ones, I asked someone for a spot. And when he didn't, you know, pull the weight up, he pulled it back, back into him, like back. And the three, 365, the bar touched the tip of my nose. I don't know how the fuck we got it up at the end, but he Holy pulled shit. it, pulled it back. You know, like oh fuck, man. That's and what I, usually happens: I, is they either pull it back towards them. Or they push mm-hmm. it forward because they panic and they go to grab it and they end up shoving it forward. And when you've got yeah. that much weight and you're trying to balance it in a straight plane, mm-hmm. you're gonna you're gonna fucking hurt yourself. Yeah, that was that was uh, scary. I yelled yeah. at him at that point. I'm sure I would yell at him too. <laughs> yeah. oh. So uh, Todd, did you did you figure out what you're doing this year? Are you gonna are you gonna oh, compete this year or what so this is where it's at this is where it's okay. at because you change your mind all the time so i figured i asked what it is this week it's not that i change <laughs> my mind all the time is that the body doesn't do exactly what it's supposed to do to stick to my schedule right. all right so um i don't need to get a show in before september because the cutoff is now november 20th because the olympia is in december right so mm-hmm. therefore the last show in the states is Legion, October seventh, Vegas, and mm-hmm. two weeks before that is the, the Alexandria show, September twenty fourth. Which means that if we if if I'm not up to like two twenty five or more at about ten percent body fat, then I'm really not within striking distance of a real three percent placement on stage and there's no point in just throwing myself at it and showing up at 177 pounds at a 212 show or 180 you know it's like it's it makes more sense just to take my time and put it all on and actually keep it on and not just to diet it all off again because going right. up to 220, coming down to 180, going up to 220, coming down to 180, enough of this shit. It's like it's either you go up to 240 and come down to 200, go up to 250, come down to 210, or you go up to like 230 and you hold that shit for a really long time and recomp it so that it solidifies the gains. Sure. Just like how Justin Compton has talked about in our very for his podcast is that he likes to hold a weight for three months to four months before dieting yeah. with it. Definitely. So, yeah. like, 
I'm like 214 right now. That means to me, 12 weeks, if I'm going slow, puts me at 226. Another four weeks of holding that might harden that up by 1% body fat. And then it gives me 12 weeks to come down. And that seven months puts us at like November, basically. Um, and that's barely going to make it for Tokyo. So it really doesn't look like anything's going to happen this year at this rate. But it's possible. It depends on how, um, how good the summer goes. It's easier in the summer than the winter because there's less bullshit with getting sick and taking time off for all that. And like... <laughs> dialed in the actual gear and food and diet and training programs perfectly. So at this point, everything should run really smooth. And if things aren't smooth, I have defaults to fall back on. Like I know exactly if I do 700 tests, 700 primo estrogen and I will have like my hair will stay the same. My guy, there will be no guy. No, I know exactly to fall to this exact thing. You experiment a little bit like, okay, let's turn the test up to a thousand and turn the primo down to 400. It's like, okay, we got gyno and we've got hair loss. Okay. That's not going to work. We got to, <laughs> and it's like, this is shit you should figure out before. But like we said, I was on DECA for years. I hadn't even used tests before. So I had to remap exactly how much test to use. And primo to mitigate the aromatization of it, and then once we hit, once that's perfectly in place, I'm going to retitrate up on the deca and see how much deca can I get away with before it aggravates the aromatase so much that it starts to make a healthy dose of test a toxic dose to test. Mm -hmm. And since I have a lot of runway left with gear because I'm growing on what's like 1.3 grams right now. I'm not using a lot of shit and I'm growing on 4,500 calories, even though I know I can handle 5,000. Don't use more if you're making progress. Cause then you're, yeah. you're one of your aces that you haven't pulled out yet to extend the life of the off season. I would say I'm about 11% right now. That's pretty good. And if I, I've been off season for what? Six, seven, eight months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I've been off season for eight or nine it's months Texas last year. Yeah. Yeah. Only 11% right now. So mm -hmm. it's not time for a mini cut. I can still keep pushing this and we'll see. But Tokyo would be really cool. That's really expensive to go out to Tokyo, but the prize is a lot. <laughs> it's very expensive to go out there. <laughs> what do you think? I would, Have you ever thought about doing Tokyo? Is this a, is it an open show or two twelve old? It's, I think they have both. I mean, I'd be doing 212, but I think there's an open division. I know that there's an open division because I think uh, that was one of the ones that Samson was trying to do a couple years ago and he couldn't do it because he couldn't get over there. I think Rogan, yeah, but, uh, Regan won it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I think, I don't know if, the, if, there's, this year, if there's one this year. That would be, that would be might, cool there might not be, I don't know. Yeah. Most of the shows over there in Europe, do they have 212 as well, the IFEB shows, or are they just pretty much just yes. open shows? Yes, because all those guys over here, you know, the, the Italians and the Sp um, uh, S S S Spaniards? Spaniards? Yeah, Spaniards. Spaniards. Yeah. Uh, they're, all, they're all not very tall, so they have to be 212. <laughs> like me? <laughs> A short Italians. <laughs> yeah, I, fig I figured they would have more over there because they're – Population of people over there, like I said, the Italians, the Romanians, the the the, uh, the Spanish people and stuff. They are, yeah, norm normally shorter people. They're all usually under five eight, so they yeah. have the two twelve shows. Over. Plus, I I think that just in general, the population, the people and stuff, like you said, there earlier, there's not that many big people over there. That the people themselves are just smaller to begin with, and I don't know if it's because of the food and everything else, or uh, food quality over there is is without all the preservatives and stuff that they just don't gain all the water weight and get is big to begin with, so they end up staying leaner and smaller all year. Also, the, I think the food availability. Um, yeah. I drive down the street in the U.S., it's like literally every other building is a, a Red Robin, a Burger King, a McDonald's, yep. a Dunkin' Donuts, like every other building. It's a car Everything. dealership, yeah. a car dealership, McDonald's, then a <laughs> car, car rental place, Dunkin' Donuts. Burger King. Like yeah. 
all over the place. <laughs> yeah, and over here it's, it's not like that. There's there's exactly. one McDonald's, and I have to I have to drive pretty pretty. I, have to, I think I have to drive 20 minutes to get to a subway. And is that in Munich? And uh, right now I'm not in Munich. Right now I'm in a, okay. a different place. But on for example, where I live on the outskirts of, on the outskirts of Munich. I actually I have to drive also to get to the next McDonald's. You know, Shit. 20 minutes, and there is no fa- on no fancy or no fast food restaurant where I live in this um, little bit of an outskirt town. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's not the case over here. I can go down the street right now, and there's McDonald's, a Burger King, and a Wendy's all within. 50 feet of each other on either side of the road, and it's a half a mile down the road. From <laughs> so. Where I live, there's a like city ordinance. No building can be over two stories. No building can be within 100 feet of the street. There can be no mm-hmm. fast food restaurants. There can be no drive throughs There can be no big boxes. But in a perimeter, like we're like an abscess. And if you drive to in any direction two miles, then – and you <laughs> – turn right and you drive down the street on the left side of the street for instance will be everything like <laughs> everything in the box around us because we're we have all these laws that protect the neighborhood so that it can't be defiled with corporate mm-hmm. and then there's no commercial districts and it's like like you said car dealership and then it's like every single big box is right there and every fast yeah. food chain and every yeah. store in every direction in Munich, it's like that with Brussels. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. There's the the inner city that is banned from um, Brussels and prostitution and all that. And as soon as you get to the outskirts, that's where all the shit starts. You know, the strip clubs and all that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so weird. I can't imagine what America would be like if there was prostitution here it's just like people think it's so weird even here that's like vegas <laughs> have non-stop violence like cutting people's heads off shooting each other all that stuff but there can't be any sex or boobs on tv <laughs> at all right it's like sex is hopeful but murder is okay and it's like well, this is why we're at war like all the goddamn time you know it's like <laughs> It's like these puritanical ideals, but human life means nothing. And it's right. so <laughs> weird. People are like, oh, it's like blah, 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 video games or why kids kill each other and shit. And so yeah, of course. we have an ultra, ultra violent culture, and then there's no sex. So there's all this pent up hostility and shit. And it's like in Europe, <laughs> sex is okay. Just violence isn't okay. Everyone's chill. And it's like, yeah. yeah. It's kind of how you said, like, every other building is fast food restaurant here. It's like their addiction is food. Yes. And it's legal. Oh, yeah. So it's a legal addiction to push sugar. So sugar's a legal drug, but cocaine and alcohol is not. And sex is illegal practically, too. Yes. But it's you can push as much sugar as possible. So they're like, like just hitting that button with a cocaine rat button. It's just like putting <laughs> flashing yellow, red, and blue lights, the primary colors that attract the humans to come push the cocaine button. So it's the cocaine sugar. And that's the only difference. It's probably just as yeah. addictive and harder yeah. to kill. <laughs> the fact that your your brain runs on sugar and you're pushing pushing more and more of it into it, you're going to get addicted. You're going to be easily addicted to that as anything else, if not easier. This it's like yeah. such a rascal weak problem here. You don't have rascals there probably at your grocery stores, but here they've got these motorized scooters. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a cup holder, but the cup holder isn't a cup holder. It's not a cup holder. It's a cup holder like this. It's yeah, like, yeah, for the huge X. Yeah, of course. So yeah. You put, your put a fucking two liter in it. 
sugar <laughs> dispenser there because it's like 84 ounces of either it's Starbucks coffee, so it's 900 milligrams of caffeine with one of these grams Mountain Dew. Of fat and cream <laughs> and all grams of sugar, or it's just this tankard that's bigger than any German beer and full of sugary pop. And it's like, we, we're worried about your bones because we're going to make sure to leach all the nutrients out of them with our phosphoric acid so that you're really soft and just melt. We wouldn't want you to be able to support your titanic 700 pound ass. So it's like we're going to melt your bones and give you sugar. So you just melt around your soggy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's all right. You go off on these tangents sometimes. I yeah, he does. He does. <laughs> That's good. I like yeah. that. All right. Well, um, I actually have to go pick my kids up in a little bit. So. We're going to cut this in here in a minute, but man, I'm, I'm glad I can finally get you on. It's, it's only been a couple of years, I Me think too. Like four, four years that we've been trying to get this and it was twice that we had it locked down. So I'm glad we could finally get you on. We'll do it again for sure. Yeah. We'll get Justin on the next time. Oh yeah. That'll be fun. <laughs> we'll get Justin on. That'd so be talk cool. Shit. Yeah. yeah. Just questions like what would the IFBB pro and his coach questions for them as a team and you probably have sure. to do the grammar correctly not my spock way of talking but no don't worry so. <laughs> all right man well i appreciate you coming on i really do we'll, uh, thank we'll you it was my pleasure thank you for having me yeah awesome dude great fight all right so for roman fritz and for uh dr todd lee i'm keith Aubrey, the weekly grand podcast sponsored by valhalla labs at valhalla-labs.com and uh, Kodiak Bodybuilding Apparel at KodiakBodybuilding.com. And we'll uh, be back next week with uh, IFBB Pro J.D. Pender. Cool.